So, um, welcome everybody here to the session uh, about a European project where SUSE is also involved, um, and uh, specifically uh, with an open SUSE LEAP installation, but we will find out later about that one, also with some other technologies. Bef but before I start, I would like to know from the audience over here, whom of you is already involved in an edge computing project? Okay, so it gets interesting. So, um, the, the, the problem that we see within edge computing is typically you have a constrained environment, right? And um, I mean, you can do edge computing everywhere, but the problem is, do you really want to put everywhere a big, big machine for your computing, um, for your computational um, stuff that you need to do there? So that was the, one of the reasons why we formed a consortium in an EU project. Um, that started last year um, and uh, is um, targeted for uh, three years, so we have 18 more months to go, where we had several um, yeah, companies um, being there, besides SUSE, also Open Nebula as one of the industry vendors, but also a lot of uh, research uh, organizations like the Umea um, University or the Rice um, um, University in um, Sweden, and also and that's that's one of the part on um, you typically try to do in those kind of EU projects to have use cases attached to them to prove what you do, what you develop is working in the field, right? Um, so that's one of the items there. So um, this is um, where most of the companies are coming from. Um, it's in a uh, in 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 smart uh, city environment. Uh, it's about wildfire detection that we had there. So um, real use cases to really see if this serverless framework that we developed is working in real life. So what is the idea? Um, basically, the idea was, okay, we need something. If you develop an edge application, um, you, yeah, you necessarily, or very, very often would like to offload computational stuff, right? Um, let's do a spoiler at that point in time. If you think about uh, doing a wildfire detection and having attached to, to trees, um, a sensor with a very small device, you can imagine power supply, yes, that's edge, right? Very constrained. Um, internet connection, okay, also quite uh, constrained. Um, and um, with, with that kind of constraints, you couldn't have that kind of computational stuff to see or to check um, and analyze pictures taken from those kind of small boxes if there really is a fire, right? So the idea is to say, okay, why not use a kind of a serverless function that's being then pushed to a more close or edge cluster, not into the centralized public cloud or into your data center that's very far, far away. Um, so, and this was the, mainly the, the base idea. And also, of course, the idea was to say, okay, we would like to make the placement where this computation is then be done in these edge clusters, needs to be orchestrated in a very intelligent way. So to put in also factors like, is there green energy? Um, um, how efficient are those machines? Um, for instance, also, um, if it's um, computation on, on sensitive data or personal data especially, um, does those uh, nodes where I put this have um, comp uh, confidential computing capabilities, right? Uh, so to make sure that you, you don't lose any kind of data. Um, so that was the, the reason um, why this project started. So there's a little bit more in, in, in um, the bullet points over here, but that's the main idea what we had um, in, in this project. So, when looking slightly, and, and I'm no developer here, to be, to be quite frankly, um, the idea was um, here to put now a little bit more about the architecture, the high-level architecture. So the device client, yes, as you can imagine, small sensors, small actuators that don't have a lot of power. 
Um, and then you have the serverless runtime. This is where, for instance, OpenSUSE is down below. Well, that's being used um, as the Blaze platform that is taking these kind of requests from the device client um, and to compute then um, the, 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 the yeah, function that uh, has been pushed up to this serverless runtime. There's also a provisioning engine, and it gets more clear if we now um, in the next slide see then the architecture in a diagram. Um, that's responsible for managing the life cycle of, of those serverless runtimes. And now comes the, um, the intelligent part of it, which is um, for Edge, each of these cloud, um, uh, of, of these edge um, clusters, we have a cloud edge manager, right? That's really placing that, um, and it uses an AI-enabled orchestrator that's computating, uh, computating the where should I place this. Uh, for this case, for instance, we also um, incorporated scaphandre or to get from those nodes the information about how much energy consumption is there, right? Um, that was one of the yeah, enhancements that we had in the first 18 months after the initial prototype was there. So how does this look like? So if you look here, you can see the device client. Um, there is a function as a service um, um, connection and um, let's say kind of a call that's going out to the serverless runtime. But um, as I said, in the initial part, the device client is going over to the provisioning engine and asks for, okay, I want a provision, I want a serverless runtime, I need to computate something um, that fulfills these requirements. Then this goes um, all through the Cloud Edge Manager in assistance with the AI enabled orchestrator to put this somewhere on one of these nodes. And as you can see, the green is here by purpose because that's where uh, OpenSUSE is in there. Um, and typically those requests are also asking for a specific kind of serverless runtime flavor. Why? Because if you have specific, um, let's say, functions that require Let's take the let's take the smart city case here, um, because there they need a specific kind of um, project, sumo project that does simulations on traffic, right? And this is a bigger part of a bigger piece of software. And if I would go there just with a general image, where I, every time I instantiate this image, need to install these sumo packages, that would take too much time. So typically. Those um, are being um, customized. Um, these packages are being installed so that it's already in that image. By the way, which is a part which we use, uh, where we use Kiwi technology for. At the moment, idea is to incorporate this also into the open build service. Because if I so look into the longer term, um, then it is an interesting item to say, okay, if someone else would like to use that aside of those four use cases that we have attached within the project itself, while it's sponsored by, by the EU, um, that's something where, yeah, it should be easy and it should also make sure that every time something that's being updated generates a new image. Because remember, we are talking about running something that's in an edge cluster. Right, so it's no data center parameter I'm working in, so I need to make sure that there is no um, vulnerability uh, as, as possible, right? So this is um, the, yeah, let's say the very rough um, uh, uh, architecture. And as always in life, um, if, you, if you work with what you built up, you at some point on time will identify that there are some gaps. Um, this was the same uh, for, for us in the project um, in our milestone uh, or month 40, 15, where we found, okay, um, we have this now running that works quite well, but there are issues because um, if you would like, for instance, to move and transfer workloads or serverless runtimes to another place because, for instance, if you think about a use case like uh, where we have moving targets that needs to connect to somewhere else that's more near, that has a better latency, right? Um, 
then I need maybe need to also transfer the serverless runtimes that are running. Um, and in that case, um, it's difficult if you have the the public IP, um, uh, yeah, that you can't move that. So also, what was um, in the beginning that, and you had seen that that um, the device client in certain cases was talking directly to the serverless runtime, right? Um, that was kind of also an, an, yeah, an issue. Um, also that these, these process, there was too much, let's say, anchor directly in between. And uh, to make a long story uh, short, what we did um, in, the, in the architecture is, okay, we need to change that a little bit. And what you can find here is that now, Everything that is uh, being done from the client is going either to the f to kind of a front end, so it's a little bit different. So it's not directly the provisioning engine; it's a front end that takes care about um, where to put. And also on the environment, the cluster, there is kind of an uh, edge cluster front end, kind of a load balancer, so that there is no direct. Um, connection between the device client and the um, the serverless runtime uh, that does not the number crunching, let's say it that way. And this meant, okay, now we have a different um, ability to organize, also to move, um, because the control over the serverless runtimes is completely um, on a on a management uh, level. And this also means, and that was also a kind of um, yeah, a requirement that we are able to say, for instance, if, if a serverless runtime is being requested, that you also have this kind of a requirement is that I have at least, let's say, five or ten or whatever number of instances um, in standby, because um, there might be cases where I can, from the application perspective, already see there will be a spin-up of more requests within a reasonable time. And this was not able or was not possible before because um, it was too much connected to the device client itself. So having seen a little bit about, roughly about how the architecture looks like, um, let's look into the um, use cases. Um, I, I already spoiled it, that there is a smart city item, there is a wildfire detection thing, um, energy uh, case that we have, and cybersecurity. Um, I would like to take out two of those, just for the sake of time that we have, um, to talk a little bit deeper about that, which is the wildfire, because um, wildfire and the energy one, because that is a very good example, in my view, um, regarding what are the challenges in edge computing, right? So, as I said, um, the idea here is um, to, um, yeah, to recognize um, um, wildfires. Um, that's by Nature 4.0 um, organization. That's in, uh, in yeah, from from a research uh, or that is a research organization out of Italy, and they started to say, okay, we would like to um, use our sensors and offload the image processing to identify is there really something going on because you have several metrics um, that you can look at and um, they designed, let's say, kind of a process. What can I do to calculate, let's say, kind of a potential that there is a fire on the device itself? And what is then the next step um, to process the, the, the picture data that I can take? And this is the reason why they, let's say, kind of developed a default mode and a high alert mode, which means if everything is okay in a periodic check on metrics that I can break down on the device itself, okay, then I'll just wait the next iteration of a minute or 30 seconds. I don't have the exact numbers here, but... Um, then it falls back to sleep because that's also one point of uh, the the, the uh, challenge here. There is no power connection, right? Uh, it's really small devices that they attach to the trees. And if those get to a level where you say, okay, 
it looks like from the metrics I have here that there is a fire going on, it tries to wake up nearby sensors at other trees to get also in the high alert mode and to go there and um, send data to the, to the um, serverless uh, runtime to process the data and uh, check if the picture is also indicating that there is a fire. And this is what I meant by where it gets um, very interesting and this was especially the use case why we said we need something uh, there where we can say, okay, if we call out, we need this amount of standby serverless runtimes because they can very quickly, it can spun up um, several um, yeah, numbers of devices that uh, say, please, here is my picture that I took. Um, is there a fire? Okay. And they broke this also down a little bit into what are the challenges. I mean, yes, devices in both cases are in, in the remote areas. In the default mode, it's okay to go a more cost efficient way, um, saying, okay, I have sleep times there. Um, I go to idle because, um, I mean, those people don't want to replace the batteries every week, right? <laughs> that wouldn't make any kind of sense and be very uh, energy efficient. But if I'm in a high alert mode, then it's important for me because I might need to react very quick so that I have low latencies. This is also why there are some parts in the orchestrator is looking at all those metrics that can help to identify, to place the serverless runtime, to compute this stuff very close by um, and with low latency. Okay, so what are the, the, the metrics um, that, that they use? Um, it's, it's carbon, it's uh, ozone, it's Temperature, humidity, also pollution, particle sizes that they that they um, yeah that they that they check on, and of course the pictures that they take with this device, which is then the the idea of being computed and calculated. So what do they use? They also shared with uh, with the bigger team what they use here. So um, it's, a, it's, it's by the TF Learn um, tool, and around that a uh, bit of TensorFlow uh, and some, some um, let's say, yeah, Python bindings that they need and that they use. And that's um, what you can see here um, is where they try a picture that was being from a live fire detection here. Uh, that's an example. Another item um, I would like to talk about is um, the energy use case. Because there it's also very, let's say, very obvious where, where, or it gets very obvious if you look a little bit into it, why edge computing is kind of a difficult beast, right? I mean, yes, you can throw a lot of money on every of those devices, but it does not really make sense and wouldn't be cost efficient from, from that perspective. This is um, an example and a use case that's being um, yeah, in a test bed in Poland where um, they try to use these smart energy meters um, to optimize um, the usage of the local energy being produced, right? Because nowadays, a lot of people have photovoltaic um, install, in, installments and use that. Um, um, we have a lot of those energy, uh, of those uh, heating systems um, that are based um, on, on you know, our use um, um, uh, electricity to, to control stuff. And so this is kind of where it starts off because you can imagine there is not much compute power in there. And even um, that was the reason why we have the C bindings for this project um, and the C libraries for this project because they don't have a lot of yeah, memory in there. Um, uh, Python and, and C are those um, that we support. And Python was the first one. And in the second iteration, we also implemented then the C libraries for that. I mean, and the idea here is really to say, use as much with, with the requirements I as a user have, use as much local energy as possible because as more I use community energy or system energy, the more expensive it will get for me, right? So that's um, the, the case, main case here. 
So if you look at what's in those, um, there are some parts in those energy meters that are not with, with uh, the focus on the, um, f the serverless uh, runtime or these, these serverless functions, but um, that's kind of, let's say, internal stuff. Um, and then there's the user partition on those devices, and that's um, yeah, just 500k, right? just 500k that you have a space there. So um, you can imagine it's a very small device from that perspective. So how does this work? So it's, um, as I said, in Poland, be smart energy. Um, so if you, if you look at a scenario, the user is going into this platform or this um, web um, interface they have um, at the um, energy uh, vendor and they set their preferences like um, when should it be warm in my home, when is typically the time that I uh, need to, let's say, um, yeah, power up my, my, my um, um, electronic vehicle or something like this. And then it kicks off a process um, on, the, on those small devices, right? Next one is then um, that this meter is going to the provisioning engine. As I said, that's based on the first version of the arch architecture, so it's going directly to the provision engine here. And um, <clears throat> ask for kind of, here, I have a function that I need to run, I need a serverless runtime, kicks this off. Um, then it starts to, to ask for download weather conditions, for instance, because that's something that you count into, okay, how much energy do I need for certain specific devices at this home? And um, then it starts to offload the kind of AI model to the serverless runtime. So um, then it is, it's going into kind of a periodic, periodical um, mode um, where in, in, in certain um, time frames um, data is being um, ex uh, yeah, exchanged um, where it's um, also getting then data back and this means that um, if it's required it sends then to those devices within the home that's controlling let's say the voltaic um, system um, or uh, let's say the the um, load uh, the, the the station for um, yeah, fueling your your e vehicle um, that's then being done there but as you can see it's always the case of you have limited space or limited of constraints on the devices and um, the idea really is at the project to balance out computation locally versus what you can do that's not in your central data center but somewhere in the region where your devices are, where your, your data devices are. So with that, that was the idea to give you just a rough overview of um, what we are doing over here and um, if you would like to get more information, um, I have the QR code here from the project homepage and also from the GitHub page where all the code that we are developing is being um, yeah, at a central uh, storage. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, just ask, reach out, um, and um, yeah, have a lot of fun um, um, regarding the rest of the, org the event over here in Nuremberg. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this nice uh, presentation. I have uh, two follow-up questions to this wildfire um, example you gave. First of all, does it run on battery and how long does it last when it's running on a battery? And secondly, do you know which protocol is used for the data transmission? Um, so regarding Battery, yes, they use batteries because they don't have any, any other kind of ray. Um, it was um, also in the beginning of the project where I was very, very carefully looking what they are using there. Unfortunately, it's something where SUSE cannot run on because it's a 32-bit item, <laughs> right? Um, I can't tell you because I don't have these details um, how, how long a battery lasts um, in those devices, but I guess it will be a little bit longer than I would have expected because, I mean, they can't go um, 
I don't have the numbers, I guess it was 135 acres or, or something like this that, that they have as a test bed. And you can't run around and every week and change that. That's, that's not possible, right? Regarding the protocol, um, in the first prototype it was not secured, but it's mainly um, the data is being exchanged with H uh, HTTP. So it's, um, and, and um, currently, uh, I guess the, the last um, setup that we had was um, then transferred to HTTPS. But as always, first is the function and later on comes security. That's not a change also in this project over here. So, so it's, a, it's a normal Wi-Fi connection? Uh, it's going over 5 uh, So you mean meant from the connection point of view? Yeah. Okay, that's a 5G. Right. Hello, thanks for the presentation. I was wondering, so the, the whole solution seems to be for like distributed ads, uh, ads computing, but uh, I was simply wondering, would this, would the project fare well if we uh, d d got a more degenerate case of a single, uh, single ads or a single node uh, uh, setup? And would, would this uh, be a, a drop-in solution for f function as a service? Uh, um, so architecture, like, would could you use your project as a single uh, so drop drop it in a, in a setup where there is only a single uh, node and then use it as a as a, a fa fast uh, solution? Uh, if this question makes makes any sense, I'm not sure. I would say that is possible, but it um, it's the, the 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 target was really this kind of I have a huge amount of devices starting to contact me and asking for a, for a serverless runtime. And that's the idea to paralyze, let's say, the computation a little bit by having um, yeah, a bunch of, of um, machines that are being spun off. Um, while the organization or the, the structure would allow also if you just have runs. I mean, we started somehow also in the project, right? And um, so we also had test cases where there in the first iteration there was just one device uh, reaching out. But it's really the parallelization of, of um, yeah, tasks that you need. Even for that, to test how scalable the infrastructure is, um, the use cases in, in some cases um, developed a simulation tool just to see how does that mm. behave if there's all of a sudden hundreds of, of thousands of connections that we try to get there. Okay, thanks. Cool. Then thank you very much for your attention. It was a pleasure to be here and um, yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference.